Hey guys, welcome to the 34th episode of the Learning Podcast. And if you're unsure, it's a Singaporean podcast dedicated to learning something new from every single guest on this show. And today, I'm very intimidated. Today, the guest I have is Mr. Shari. Mr. Shari, thanks so much for taking the time to join this podcast. Hi guys, thanks a lot for having us over, JJ. One person that I must thank is Africa, who is on this Zoom call as well, just to observe this call. And I'm sure that she will be able to add in any questions uh, as and when she wants. And I really want to thank her because she's the one that actually lies uh, me with Mr. Zainal, who I had on this podcast about 10, about 18 episodes ago. A little context is about Mr. Shari. Mr. Shari is a very experienced in his field. He's currently the Vice President of Strategy and Project Management Office at the Singapore Aero Engine uh, services private limited and if i'm not wrong it's uh it's a it's an entity related to rolls royce and mrs shario himself has studied in the U- uh, uk and he actually got his mba at oxford and one of the business schools there mr shario i'm so sorry if i pronounced the business school name wrongly is it Said business school uh, Said. Sa- Said business school a couple of reasons why i think this conversation will be helpful if you're in the engineering field i think uh, Mr. Sherry has experience of joining an engineering company in a sense and going all the way up into, I would say, senior executive level. He's a vice president. And what he deals with is like the project management of uh, servicing big uh, engines. So if I'm not wrong, I did a little homework onto it. It's like a trend engines which are produced by Rolls Royce and I'm sure that he will be able to provide like this whole thought process in terms of what it takes to manufacture, service, all this kind of big manufacturing things okay i'm always very fascinated when i talk to like engineers in a sense of architectures people who are very different from me because it's very clear that they see the world in a very different way and i myself coming from a marketing point of view right it's always interested to find out the other perspective as well a couple of other reasons why i think this podcast will be helpful mr shavu himself i did an mba of course at oxford and i think that if if you ever are interested in pursuing uh, further studies, I, I think that Mr. Shari can offer a lot of advice on to why he did that because I'm sure he can give an insight on to why, why he felt that there was a need to take this MBA in a sense. Uh, Mr. Shari, thanks so much for taking the time. Uh, for those listeners that don't know who you are, could you give a quick context if I have missed any important detail? Thanks a lot, JJ, for the introduction. Uh, and definitely excited to be uh, in this session. Definitely excited to have this chat with you. Uh, and really looking forward to sharing my experience with uh, all the audience on this podcast. So let me just introduce myself. My name is uh, Sharil, Sharil Taha. Uh, at the present moment, I'm the Vice President for Strategy and Project Management Office, as DJ mentioned earlier, uh, with this company called Seizo, which is Singapore Aero Engine Services, Private Limited. Uh, and I also work for Rolls-Royce. So I'm seconded from Rolls-Royce into this uh, joint venture between Rolls-Royce and Singapore Airlines Engineering Company. So in this uh, company, we uh, manufacture... In Rolls-Royce, we manufacture and we do MRO for, MRO is maintenance, repair and overhaul for jet engines. So if you've been, I know it's been a while since most of us have flown, but if you've uh, flown on an A380, if you've flown on an A350 or a 787 Dreamliner during your holidays to Europe uh, or to anywhere else, if you're on Scoot, SIA, Qatar uh, or Emirates, you would have flown on an aircraft that is most likely powered by a Rolls-Royce engine. And guess what? Those Rolls-Royce engines are manufactured and assembled in Singapore. So just take a moment just to think about it. Those jet engines that are on the airplanes that's going to bring you 8,000 miles or 12,000 miles away, those are manufactured and assembled by the guys and girls in Singapore itself. So how fantastic is that? From a small red dot, that's from this small island of ours, uh, the, uh, the, we're punching well above our weight and uh, able to provide a global supply chain. So, uh, in my, I guess to, just to introduce myself, I'm uh, married with uh, to my beautiful wife, and I have three kids, age uh, twelve, eight, and five. It's always exciting to be uh, playing around with the kids because uh, they're very inquisitive. And as an engineer, I absolutely love that. Uh, I started off my career building race cars. Uh, so I was doing race cars and race engines, and I was racing race cars in uh, UK and in Detroit. Uh, then I went on to do uh, oil and gas. So I was building oil rigs and drill ships, so huge drill ships, 300 meters long, that we float out into the sea. It's then positioned by the geopositionary uh, uh, thrusters just to keep it in the same spot as we drill kilometers into the ground. 
so I did drill ships and I did uh, oil rigs. And then I moved on to do consulting in telecommunications. So I was dealing with uh, uh, companies like Telefonica. Uh, and then I moved on to aerospace. So it's been six, seven years since I've been in aerospace. Uh, and it's been very exciting. So I've done cars, I've done ships, and then I've done uh, aircrafts. Uh, my wife always disturbs me and says that the next thing I should do do is trains, either trains or skateboard. So I'm happy with either. Yeah. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, my training, I am a mechanical engineer by training. Uh, I've done quite a fair bit of uh, design work. Uh, I used to run operations, uh, and then now I'm doing project management uh, as part of supporting operations. So it's been a very fantastic career. Uh, I've, I've absolutely enjoyed every moment of it, uh, and I've absolutely enjoyed the opportunities that I had. Uh, and I would definitely like to share this opportunity or share my experiences with uh, uh, the viewers on this podcast. So that's me in a nutshell, JJ. Could you bring us back all the way to your days in the National University of Singapore? Because right now you are the vice president of this very big company, right? So I think that undergraduates like me see that as something that's really quite unattainable and it's something that is probably 10 or 20 years into our career, right? So can you bring us back to the days as an undergraduate? I understand that you after, after NUS, after uh, graduating with a bachelor's in mechanical, mechanical engineering, uh, you actually stay on to do research on to, uh, on to building cars and such. So could you just bring me through the thought process of you have graduated from NUS in a sense and you, you have stayed on as like a research in a research field of cars. Could you paint me a picture of your decision on how you did that and how you eventually went into the oil and the gas industry and how of course eventually started doing an MBA. But of course, we will just uh, take our time to go there. But just the thought process as an undergraduate, what was going through your mind when you first graduated from NUS? So in order to understand my thought process or in order to share my thought process in that space, uh, let me take you about two to three years before I graduated or even just uh, at the decision point of why I decided to do engineering. So growing up, uh, I was always, uh, my, my father is a very technical guy. Uh, so we do a lot of DIY projects. So we used to cut up lots of wood and then we did wood paneling and we did our own furniture back home. So as a young kid, uh, I was quite used to using hand tools uh, since the age of 10, 11, 12, and I was always tinkering with things. Uh, so doing something in the technical field, is a I feel it's a natural progression for me. However, after in US, sorry, after my NS uh, at the crossroads, I was actually deciding between either doing economics or engineering. Economics was also a passion of mine during the JC years. Uh, I quite like uh, uh, doing uh, economics and trying to understand the world from that perspective. But at that juncture, I decided that uh, technical field is something that I have to learn now and I can pick up economics later. And that's where I went uh, with the engineering group. So halfway through NUS, right? As everyone knows, engineering is one of the more, I would say, the more dreadful uh, 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 courses where there's quite a fair bit of lectures, there's quite a fair bit of math, and there is exciting things like the uh, Navier-Stokes theorem, which you think that, oof, I've never used the mathematical equation uh, in my life ever again. <laughs> so it, it was definitely very challenging for me because I'm, uh, I'm a very hands-on person. So in year two, actually, uh, me and a group of friends, we decided that, hmm, for our final year project, we're going to do something different. We're going to build a race car and we're going to race it in Detroit. That was our idea. Uh, so based on from that idea itself, of course, uh, back then there was uh, the six, seven of us. Uh, we had no fun. We had no idea how to build a race car. There was no uh, race car industry in Singapore uh, to build from scratch. So we decided to do the research ourselves, and I was also in charge of marketing and trying to get the funds for it. To cut the long story short, we managed to raise quite a fair bit of funds. About, I believe it was $1.5 million in, in total uh, for us to build that race car. Uh, in the first year, during year three, when we were building it, we actually failed uh, to bring it to Detroit. We didn't have enough funds to bring it to Detroit. But in year four, 
uh, we were resolute and we made sure that it happened and we managed to bring the race car to uh, Detroit, Michigan for the race. And from 127 uh, entrants from universities, we emerged as the 27th overall. We thought, not bad, not bad for, for the first time for us. So when we talk about building race car, this is building it from scratch. This is a single-seater race car. Uh, carbon fiber arms, um, uh, single-seater, open-wheel concept, like a mini F1 kind of thing, right? So it was at that point that uh, I've already spent two to three years uh, doing it. That was when I was offered a job by uh, my my mentor. And those of you in NUS, in mechanical engineering, you must know this name, Professor Sia Ka Heng. Right? He is a legend, an absolute legend in NUS. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. Uh, so he then uh, offered me a job uh, as a research engineer to build up the automotive specialization program in NUS. So that's how the automotive specialization program in NUS started. It was born from uh, passions from students. Uh, and then it was a crazy idea that for an FYP, let's build a race car and go and race it in Detroit. So that was how my first foray into uh, NUS started. And as a research engineer, I was uh, helping other students uh, build race cars and also pushing the boundaries of uh, uh, every individual uh, race car. And I will, I'm really glad to say now that the, the program has continued for the past 16 years, I believe. Uh, and I believe NUS is in its 16th or 17th or 15th race car already every year since 2005. So, uh, and I'm glad that that program has benefited uh, a lot of students. So that's how I started uh, my role in uh, as a research engineer in NUS. So at the same time as uh, helping out with the students, I was uh, also seconded to uh, a company called Ricardo UK. So Ricardo UK designs engines. Uh, and that's where I was working in UK, uh, doing research, designing race car engine. Uh, and I had a few opportunities. One was working on a race car engine. Uh, and another one was working on a three-cylinder 1,000cc uh, Hyundai. Sorry, it was the Devu Matisse, a small car. So it was quite interesting uh, to work on one end of the spectrum, uh, a race car pushing out lots of horsepower uh, and a 1,000cc uh, three-cylinder engine about the size of this big. Yep. So that's how I, that's how I started my career in uh, automotive. Because per personally myself, I have many uh, mecha mechanical engineering that are actually involved in this program. So they literally fly to uh, the US to race. So technically you are the pioneer of this movement, right? In the US. <laughs> yes, 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 we were. The few of us, uh, we, we, we decided to, to uh, pursue this dream of ours. Because then when, when I was in NUS and we were always doing uh, a lot of the theory and a lot of the lectures, uh, the group of us, we wanted to turn theory into practical. So, for example, when we were uh, learning about design, engineering design, we wanted to do real CAD drawing, real design work. Uh, when we were uh, doing things about heat transfers and thermodynamics, so that was something that really uh, uh, interested me. Uh, and hence, that's why I picked up the radiator and the cooling system for the engine. Uh, to translate whatever we see in the textbook into reality. Can I ask from your perspective in being this pioneer movement, right? In terms of transitioning theoretical knowledge to real world applications, right? During those times, right? What, what challenges do you face in terms of doing this? Because you are the first, technically the first batch of students and not the professors, right? Students to do this, right? What kind of challenges do you face in transition and making this theoretical knowledge applicable? Being the first doing it, and even the first in Singapore, because Singapore doesn't have uh, automotive industry, right? Uh, being the first to do it, uh, there is no one but yourself uh, to try and figure out uh, what it actually means. So when you look at the theory, whether it's what you want to execute uh, uh, in, in reality, there is no one to refer to as there's no, uh, there's no one in the industry. There's a lot of trial and error. But there's also a lot of uh, times where you've got to just make the decision and you've got to trust your knowledge and your instinct. So never uh, shy away or never be worried with failures. You've got to try your best, stick to it, and if you fail, you try it again. 
you, you fail fast, you learn fast and keep on moving. So I think that was one thing that we needed to, to uh, learn very quickly and adapt very quickly. So given that we were still students, there was a, a ticking timeline. Yeah? So every year we need to complete a, a certain project by a certain time. right? So you're always pit against a deadline. Uh, and that's where even if you fail, you got to make it happen. Uh, you got to figure out how to how to make it happen. And I think that has also honed my skills as an engineer. I'm sure it's treading a fine line because when you talk about failure in engineering, right, you're talking about like thousands of dollars being, in a sense, wasted, right? <laughs> so, is there any advice? Let's say, let's say if I'm I'm I'm, I'm like an engineer who is like really treading this field of failure, and I mean, of course, we learn from failures, but from your experience, yeah. like, how do you tread that fine line between finite resources and failure at the same time? So it's about uh, managing risk. So, and we'll talk about it later, right? Project management and engineering is about managing risk. What you don't want is to create something that's so big that when it fails, it becomes a $2 million problem, right? You do it in small incremental steps. Uh, and that's where the concept of uh, fail fast, learn fast comes in. You do it in small stages, you, you uh, make sure that it doesn't lead to a catastrophic failure. Uh, uh, you learn from your mistakes, you measure what you did wrong, you analyze, you improve, and then you control the next step so that it doesn't go wayward. So one of the biggest failures that I had right, during this time period was um, because of uh, the lubrication system that I designed, we completely blew the piston because the engine wasn't lubricating well. So that piston, I should have kept it. I should have brought it for this session. That piston is something that sits on my table till today because it reminds me of uh, uh, managing failures and making sure that we learn from the mistakes and learn it fast. Okay, that's that's very very, very interesting. Uh, if I may jump a call. So when it comes to all these kind of small little events, right, that little piston reminds you of that failure, right? Can I can I just jump all the way into what like what you're doing right now in terms of project management for like big big engines, right? Yeah. Is there a difference when it comes to managing all these kind of like million multi million dollar like jet engines and what you did in engineers? Is there a similarity in a sense? Let's work with uh, the similarities first. Let's talk about the similarities first, and then we'll talk about the major differences. So when it comes to similarities, right, as an engineer or any at any point of or anyone in any stage of his life or in any career, uh, for me, my thought process uh, comes from the following acronyms: D M A I C. You define what's the problem. You measure where you're at right now, your current situation. You analyze, you improve, and you control. So when I was building race cars, uh, and we were measuring and having sensors on every different part of the race car, right? Uh, whether it is the steering input of the driver or it is the throttle input of the driver, how much he stepped on the accelerator, how much he, uh, the angle of his steering versus uh, how much power the engine is outputting, what is the RPM, what is the traction, what is the G-force. So you're measuring all these kind of things. And why do you measure? You measure because you want to understand and you want to be able to narrate what uh, the current situation is. Once you measure, you analyze. You analyze what is the problem and where could you do better. And then the next step is then you improve it and then you control it. So no point in improving something only for it to dip again. As you improve, you control it, maintain it there, and then you improve again, you control it, and you improve again. And that's the whole concept of continuous improvement. So if you take that, take that uh, thought process, that methodology, right, and you translate it into any job that you have, whether you're in marketing, whether you, you're uh, looking at data from uh, engagement of the audience, you understand what is the input variable that affects your output, for example, if you were to be using this particular marketing medium or marketing platform, you get X number of increase in uh, uh, engagement of participants, and then you continuously improve it. It's the whole concept of improvement. So if you take that whole thought process, that whole methodology, and then you bring into where I am right now in that industry, as you look uh, at projects, you, you understand what are the variables, what is the input variables that allows you to deliver a project on time, on target, to cost. 
right? Uh, and then you tweak the variables and you improve the process such that it becomes better and better. So that is one thing that I find that is very similar in that space. It's about uh, if you can't define, the first step is always defining where you are and measuring where you are, how you are performing. And then you're always about analyzing how can you improve it. Then you institute the improvements, execute the improvements, and then you make sure the improvements stick and you keep it at that level. That's how you increase the power for uh, all the time and just continuously challenging yourself. And this applies to all industry or any form of occupation. Uh, where it is different though, so in a race car, it's a bit more, uh, I would say half of it is uh, a sport, half of it is entertainment. It's an expensive sport, definitely. Uh, but with aircraft and aeroplanes, we're dealing with lives. With a race car, I can pull a race car to the side of the street and it's fine. We can go and troubleshoot it. With an engine, an aircraft engine, you can't pull off to the curbside. There's no curbside to begin with. So in the aerospace industry, it is very different in the sense that it is tightly regulated and safety is paramount because uh, uh, failure is not uh, so much of an option. Failure is not even an option in, in, in aerospace. So it's a lot more control. You make sure that when you do your test, you do very rigorous testing uh, and safety is never a concern uh, uh, in the aerospace industry. I mean, it is our responsibility working in the aerospace industry from someone who's working on the shop floor, tightening the bolts of an engine to someone who's building the factory uh, who, who designed, uh, or someone who's designing the engine at every level in that industry, everyone has to contribute to safety. So that's where it becomes uh, somewhat different. I'm not saying that automotive, they don't talk about safety, but the rigor of the safety uh, uh, measures that's put in place is uh, different in multiple folds. So that's where, that's where it's, it's different. So for me, I, I started my career in the aerospace industry uh, building jet engines. So we were building the Trend 900 and the Trend 1000, which is the engines for the Airbus A380, you know, the huge A380, I believe it's 300 ton, 380 ton, fully loaded is 500 ton. Uh, the A380 and the 787 Dreamliners. Uh, I started off my, my uh, experience in the aerospace industry building, assembling and testing those engines with my team in Slater. Uh, now I've moved on to building new factories. The last factory that I built was uh, together my team was in Germany. Uh, and then now we're looking at similar expansion programs in Singapore. So we set mindset in place and every step of the way, number one, figure out how to improve, how to make the project, how do you deliver the project on time, to cost, to budget, and how do we do it better? Uh, and number two is uh, how do you institute all the safety requirements uh, in place that is required for the aerospace industry? So there's a bit of similarity and differences in that space, uh, but it's definitely something that uh, through my years, uh, in the engineering field to my years in uh, uh, designing and building stuff uh, something that you continuously build on. All right, okay, like from what I'm hearing, I think what you're doing is really, I would say, because I talk to many of my engineering friends, right, and many of the, and many of the times that they talk to me, they say they want their work in a sense to have an impact and I can see that the kind of impact that you're making is really, I would say, making a lot of engineers or at least undergraduates in general quite envious in a sense, right? Can I just ask in terms of your early years in um, early years in Rolls Royce, right? When I think you were back in the UK, right? What does it take to be, let's say, an engineer who is good in the aerospace industry in general? I know you talk a lot about safety, right? But in terms of let's say the other key components that makes a good engineer in its sense, what other key components do you think is essential for every early engineer in their career to take note of? So I, I think uh, that's a good, that's a really good question, JJ, because uh, I often have this uh, chat with uh, the interns coming in uh, or young engineers. I think the first and foremost as an engineer, uh, you should always remain inquisitive. You should always keep your curiosity alive, right? Uh, there is a saying in the industry, uh, uh, a person who only worries about the theory is a scientist. 
a person who worries about science, uh, theory and the economics of things is an engineer. An engineer's job is always bounded by uh, executing it to uh, a, a practical uh, business problem. So, for example, it's perfectly fine to design uh, a part, uh, but it's not, sorry, let me rephrase that. It's, uh, you may design a part uh, that cannot be easily manufactured or that cannot be manufactured uh, cheaply. And no matter how good that part is, it doesn't make sense in the business world. Right? If you were to pay, even if you had a, a fantastic uh, a car that cost $10 million, not many people want to purchase it. So an engineer is always trying to balance all these different uh, variables from design constraints to economic constraints to costing constraints and things like that. And that's why it's very important for an engineer to remain inquisitive. Keep his mind open. Understand what's coming in, digest it, and then improve on, on it. So for, for an engineer, definitely the, uh, having, to all, having the mindset of always asking why, right? always exploring, never stopping there. Uh, and def the other one is also pride in your work. When you are doing any engineering task, there's no one who's going to be seated next to you asking you, did you do this right? Did you do this wrong? Right? But it is always within you, your pride in your work, not to cut corners, not to, cut, uh, not to take the easy way out. So as a young engineer, definitely remain inquisitive and uh, uh, pride in your work. Because what we do as an engineer, whether you are designing a hot water flask or you are designing uh, a jet engine or you're working on it, whatever you do affects uh, someone's lives. Uh, and then that's the pride that you need to keep within yourself because this uh, is a responsibility that you take on as an engineer. Okay, got it. That's, that's a very interesting that I, I see that um, you, you aren't really talking about like tangible skills to start with. And I like how you focus the how the skills of engineers is meant to solve business problems instead of just um, being fixated on the means or like the tools of it. On, on, on the other contrary, because in your experience of being an engineer, right, I know that you have seen like, I mean, you have went through a lot of, you see a lot of employees, you manage a lot of employees, right? In a sense, I know that this is like an opposite question. What, what kind of mistakes do engineers commonly make, especially young, young engineers? That's also a really good question. And I think uh, how I'll answer that is definitely engineers that uh, just work within their silos. If you just bound yourself to a certain set of parameters and you don't think beyond it. Those are the engineers that struggle in the industry, in whichever industry that you're in. And the reason why I say that is it, it's even more relevant now. For viewers here, you may be graduating with uh, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, or any specific engineering function. But in the real world, in the industry, you don't exist as one entity. You're often working with different engineers uh, with different constraints. You're working with a project manager that has specific business deliverable. You're working with the marketing guy who uh, is trying to uh, touch a particular uh, marketing uh, uh, market segment. Uh, so you're always working with others. And if you're an engineer who thinks that his responsibility is this, is this is what I'm only responsible for, and you only think within your four box without uh, any doors or without any windows to the outside world, that's where you will struggle, especially in this day and age of interconnectivity like Industry 4.0. Right? Your data from one process in the value stream flows to all the different segments in the value stream. I'll give you an example. If you look at Amazon itself, right? So Amazon as a company, uh, and, and the reason why I can share this is because I had a stint in Amazon also working with Amazon Fulfillment Center in UK. So amazing fact of Amazon, during Christmas, during the Christmas period, they would deliver 2 million parcels during that period, that short period of two days especially. 2 million parcels with almost 0% uh, 
uh, failure rate. Failure rate means it will always deliver on time and it will always deliver the right parcel to the right people. Right? So we always see Amazon as just that shopping uh, uh, website, but there is a huge supply chain behind it. There's a huge warehousing uh, uh, operation behind it. There's a huge marketing function uh, ahead that does also the data analytics to see what customers are going to buy and then predict what form of uh, uh, purchase or stocking it requires. And there's a huge delivery mechanism at the tail end for the last mile delivery. In Amazon, if you look at the whole value stream of Amazon, it starts off with what we usually see is the website itself. But what we don't see is the whole value stream. From upfront, the marketing guys and the data analytics guys who is crunching the data, uh, uh, segmenting you in a target market, and then proposing what you should be buying. All right. As we go downstream into the fulfillment centers, into how things are ordered, there is a whole operations on uh, how do you execute your order into uh, an actual demand on the warehouse. Then in the warehouse itself, that's trying to deliver the 2 million parcels during this Christmas period. Imagine that 2 million parcels in 48 hours. How fast must the delivery mechanism be in one uh, fulfillment center? So there are engineers and operations guys who's doing the data uh, to, to crunch the numbers to improve that process. And then there's the last mile delivery guys, the, uh, the guys doing the delivery on what is the fastest way to uh, uh, deliver the parcel to the individual. So all at every point of this value stream, there is someone working on the data. But from a customer's perspective, all I see is the at the moment I order from Amazon Prime, 24 hours later, I should be receiving it. The customer only sees that. They don't see the background function where all the different individuals, the engineers and uh, uh, the people working for Amazon will be sharing and trading this data. Right? Because the customers only see that value but doesn't see that whole uh, operation behind it. So with that being said, tying back to your question, uh, where uh, uh, engineers that struggle, or, or I find that people who struggle in this new industry, especially in this new economy, are those that is unable to think uh, outside of their confines of what they're supposed to do. I'm sure many of us, even during your internship time, uh, you encounter a, a, a situation where you, where you ask yourself, hmm, it, this doesn't really feel like my job description. Or why am I doing something over and above? Right? But this is the fact of the new economy. The new economy, things are changing. Look beyond the job this, your current job description because things are changing. It's unprecedented and we're moving and transforming. So new graduates who uh, uh, struggle to comprehend that uh, find it difficult to adapt in the new uh, environment. So adaptability and versatility and agility uh, are definitely values uh, that would help you when you join uh, any industry. Yeah, I, I like how you said like these principles because when you talk about uh, how you need to be really, in a sense, more macro perspective, like seeing the whole picture of what it is, I think, I think yeah, it, it, what you're saying really resonates with me in a sense. Can I ask from a more, more of a selfish perspective because I have a lot of engineering friends, right? The conversations I have with them is that they feel that when they enter like big engineering companies, let's say you say Dyson, Rolls Royce and comparing the allure of it compared to the startup. So I have a lot of friends that wants to, let's say, go into the Silicon Valley engineering space because that's where all the exciting things are. And from their perspective of having, let's say, internship experiences in Silicon Valley and when they come back to Singapore, they say that, I feel that the engineering landscape in Singapore isn't just as exciting, right? Um, what are your thoughts on, let's say, comparing the career opportunities and the engineering excitement you get from working in startups relative to all these kind of big engineering companies? And having had our experience of working in both, uh, I think there is definitely learn lessons to be learned in either environment. So in the big companies, okay, big companies would have started from a startup. Mm -hmm. So from a startup at its grow and at its scale, and it becomes a major conglomerate, one of the challenges that you, when you are uh, in the later stages of your career, you face that, how do you manage scale? 
how do you manage the size of uh, a business that is 1,500 people or 15,000 people? The only way to manage that is through process and through standards. So that's how you manage and making sure the quality is always maintained in a big organization. I guess you can look at it both ways. Fortunately and unfortunately, uh, some processes may help uh, uh, generate the innovativeness, but some processes may be seen as bureaucratic and slows down the innovation. So at the present moment, we one of the reasons for this, uh, we call it this uh, next industrial revolution is even major huge corporations had to start pivoting their time to market to bring a product into the market becomes shorter and shorter. So the old bureaucratic processes where you need three, four, five signatories in order to manage uh, a huge size company now needs to be collapsed into a, a, a quick process with a quick turnaround in order to meet the customer's demand of a quick turn, uh, time to market. So I guess where I'm coming from is, it is true in major corporations, uh, you find it a bit more, for the lack of better word, stifling or a bit more harder or a bit more bureaucratic. But the corporations are, uh, are now uh, relooking at their processes to make it uh, more dynamic. Unlike in a startup where a decision uh, from where you are to that decision is potentially maybe two or three layers away because the startup is small, it has maybe five, ten people who can drive that decision making process. The decision is about one or two phone calls away and you sort it and you can move in that direction. So it feels a lot more rapid in a startup. But at the same time, when a startup starts to scale, it needs to put in processes. So as uh, people who's joining the industry, you need to be cognizant of this difference between a startup and a large corporation. But most importantly, in the experience that you have in either of these environments is to get the most out of it. When you're in a startup, explore, uh, uh, drive the initiative, go beyond your job description, uh, challenge, look for the value proposition, and get your breath. If you're working in a startup, most chances are you will be able to work on uh, breath uh, uh, of skills. Uh, as an engineer, you'll also be doing the purchasing, you'll be doing the uh, uh, bill of material, you could potentially also be doing the marketing. Right? Because it's a small startup, you've got to do, you'll be a jack of all trades. In a larger corporation, you'll most probably be doing a particular engineering role, but with greater depth. So both these opportunities, I don't think we should uh, be looking at it from a which is better. But I think uh, in every situation, how we should be looking at it is uh, what can we learn from this situation? Because at the end of the day, with where the industry is heading, where, where the new economy is heading, it's going to be a mixture of the pace and the agility of a startup with the control and the scalability of uh, uh, a large corporation. If you look at Amazon, if you look at Baidu, if you look at uh, Airbnb, uh, or even when you look at Tesla, right? Uh, 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 with the startup culture, how do you then manage the control and the scale of where you need it to be? Because for the uh, uh, participants on this podcast, if you want to be growing that $2 billion company, right? it can't be just the five of you. It will begin with the five of you, but you're going to have to scale it up. So it's about balancing the needs of both or getting the experiences from both and, and, and reaching you as an individual. Hope that helps. Cody, I like, I like you both need to really say which is better because um, yeah, the conversations I have with my undergraduate friends is like, should I join a startup? Should I join a large corporation? Which do you think is better? I know you say that there isn't really necessarily that is one is better than the other, but from your perspective of being such a senior executive in your company, right? What is your preference? <laughs> For me, uh, what helps is uh, if you start off with uh, experience in uh, larger corporation or an SME, uh, understanding a bit about process, uh, 
but you continue to uh, move along with that passion and with that excitement uh, into a startup, that helps. The truth of the matter is uh, when you apply for a role in any industry or in any jobs, uh, uh, the, the companies that you put, on, put in in your CV matters. Right? So it helps that uh, your first two jobs are in a bigger corporation and then when you move into a startup, uh, you'll have that opportunity to practice a bit more on the, the uh, exploratory and on the uh, um, challenging and doing new stuff. Uh, if you were to do it the reverse, when you spend quite a fair bit of time on startup, uh, it's difficult to translate that into the industry and convert that into uh, something in the industry. So I give you an example. If you were to be working for a, a company like uh, maybe Capital, for example, right? You work for Capital the first two years, understand processes, learn processes, uh, and then when you move into a startup, it's the same you. You still have the same passion, but you'll be in a better position to manage a team uh, of engineers or a team uh, in a particular project. If in contrast, contrary, if it was the opposite, if you were managing uh, or if you were in a startup uh, uh, and you were acting alone and you've uh, gotten that two or three years of experience in a startup, it would be very difficult for you to progress from there into a management role in a larger corporation. So although I say there is no which is better, but uh, my pragmatic view on things is uh, as part of your career progression, uh, that sequence may help, but may not necessarily be the only way. I hope that helps. Yeah, I strongly empathize with that. At least it's one of the reasons why for myself in the media space, right? What I do is that I run digital ads, right? As a startup, I have only like so much money, but when I join a big agency with big money to play, right, I can see how like millions of dollars are being spent on digital advertising in that sense. So I really empathize in the sense where I feel that what you're saying is like go into a large corporation to have that depth of expertise. And after that, technically management skills of people, managerial things, you could translate and pick that up along the way. And I think that, that serves as a good segue to your decision in terms of pursuing an MBA. Right? I'm curious as to know why, why did you make a decision to transit and take an MBA at Oxford? It wasn't an easy decision for me when I took on my MBA. So just to put it into context, uh, my second daughter was just born. She was only three weeks old uh, when I uprooted the whole family, uh, quit my job and moved to UK uh, to do my MBA on my own cost. Right? So it, it, when I reflect back on uh, the decision I made back then, it, it's quite... Uh, Exciting, and it was quite a leap of faith during that, that period of time. So the reason why I did it was, um, at that point, I believe that was um, six or seventh year uh, since I graduated, and I was doing uh, operations management role in Capital, running one of the business units. So I was running one of the business units for about two years already. It was about the size of uh, 200 employees, 200 employees and with a revenue of about $30 million uh, per year. Uh, so we've, during that period of time, during that two years, uh, as a young manager, uh, I was barely 30 then. Uh, I was making decisions that was impacting the lives of others. Right? As it affected the PNL, as it affected the profit and loss, it affected the bonuses, whether it was uh, helping the company out or not helping the company out. When dealing with the workers or employee issues, all right, uh, whether you give off or leave or whatever it is, it is affecting the lives of others. When you decide on going a particular way on driving that improvement, it also affects the lives of others and the morale of others. During that two years that I was in that role, I was also doing lean transformation, so improving productivity. And engaging, and engaging a lot with the guys on the shop floor, driving that change management. I managed to turn around that company uh, and brought more profits to the company. 
to and it was at that point that I decided to okay, let's take a breather. The decisions that I've made the past two years was based on my gut feel and was based on where I thought it was right. But this could this may not be the only way in which decisions can be made. I'm sure many uh, has gone through this process, many has gone through this experience, and what can I learn from the experience of others? So that was the fundamental reason why I decided to do my master's in business, business administration. It was more a reflection on uh, myself, on how do I make myself a better leader? The challenge as you join the industry is you hone your skills, you get better with your skills uh, uh, in your particular field, whether it is engineering or marketing or sales, you get you, you, you become a better employee based on the skills that you have. But your next step when you are a manager or you're managing a team of uh, individuals, none of the skills that you have necessarily translates into being a better manager, a better leader. I'll give you an example. I have been designing stuff at that point for five, six years. Uh, I'm uh, quite happy with my engineering skills, but then now I'm managing a team. That engineering skills does not translate into being a better leader, being able to drive my team forward. And I've been just trying to shoehorn it through what my gut feel was. And hence, that was the reason why I wanted to do uh, an MBA, uh, was to learn from others, how do I be a better leader? How do I lead? How do I drive thought leadership? And how do I inspire? And how do I uh, uh, bring the team together to achieve greater heights? And the reason why I chose Oxford, because uh, in Oxford's slogan, 700 years of educating leaders, right? So all the uh, key leaders, world leaders, would have gone through Oxford at their point of time. And I wanted to learn leadership. I wanted to learn thought leadership. And I wanted to learn how to be a better leader from the best place that provided that. In an environment that also worked with the best minds from all the different industries or all the different uh, faculties. So whether it was the history faculty or whether it was the uh, engineering faculty or biomedical, uh, all these faculty were huge heavyweights inside uh, Oxford itself. Uh, and as the business uh, school, Fayed Business School was at the center of it all, you can pull together all these uh, brilliant minds uh, and learn from the best. So that was my reason for doing it in Oxford and that was my reason for doing an MBA. Sorry if I may ask like a basic question, is there like a the difference between thought leadership and leadership. Like, I know you talk about how it's really being a better leader and manager, but is there a difference? So being a leader could also be a role. Uh, so when you say being a leader, you are entrusted into that particular role, right? Uh, and you have your team underneath you and they look at you as a leader because hierarchically, you are their leader. You are structured as their leader they will be listening to you uh, or they'll have the repercussions, lesser bonus and stuff like that. <laughs> so that is just being a leader and trusted to that position. But thought leadership, very often as you progress through your career, those that is listening to you may not necessarily be people who report to you. So this is especially true in a uh, uh, skill set like program management, right? Uh, so as a thought leader, you are trying to inspire, you are trying to rally people based on your ideas, based on your values, without any formal hierarchical structure. There is no reason for someone to listen to you because he doesn't report to you or uh, uh, he doesn't naturally need to see you as uh, his leader. But how do you get that emotional hook? How do you get that following? How do you make sure that uh, you are able to convey and rally and align people to a particular strategic direction? So that's about being a thought leadership. Being a leader is very hierarchical. You are a leader, a platoon commander. 
you are a, a, a sergeant or you are a manager in an, any organization, right? Uh, there's many ways in which you can be a leader. You can lead by fear. You can lead by inspiration. You can lead by uh, uh, just a matter of fact, uh, that's what it says on your name card. That's why you're a leader. Uh, but I think it's about the balance of both. Uh, organizationally, where you stand, how do you drive that forward? And as an individual, how do you inspire? How do you trigger? How do you want uh, to excite people to take on the next step? Yes, yes. I, I never thought of it that way because I didn't. I wasn't very familiar with the the differences in definitions. But yeah, from so in your perspective, how do you get the emotional hook? How do you inspire? In, in a sense, like what are the kind of macro principles you have learned? I, I'm really more interested in terms of the thought leadership perspective. Um, yeah, what I know is this is like a mini MBA class in a sense. <laughs> in terms of really building up thought leadership in a person, right? What kind of tips or advice? or lessons would you give in terms of building thought leadership within him or her? Because in my opinion, I think, I, I mean, I don't want to say that it will work either or is the best. I mean, maybe in an army setting, it works to have just a hierarchical uh, relationship. But for my experience, I think it's always good to have and have that aspect of thought leadership in the sense you're inspiring, motivating, uh, building uh, emotional connection with whoever who's not necessarily working for you, which I think is quite important as well. So what kind of advice or tips in terms would you give to someone who is interested in building their thought leadership? Because I think, in my in my opinion, I think everyone everyone should think they'll play their role in terms of building their thought leadership in a sense, and it makes just the whole dynamics of a team better in a sense. Yeah, I, I think JJ, you definitely hit the nail on the head. Uh, and as you progress through your career, right, uh, your ability in thought leadership becomes even more important because. Now that you're a manager, you can manage your team to whichever way you want it to be, whether you want it to be a bit more uh, uh, top-down approach or you want it to be a bit more collaborative. But at that, at that point in your career, you are then trying to manage uh, your, the cross-functional teams with your peers uh, and those that is uh, above you also. So that's where thought leadership becomes even more important. Right? And as you scale up, uh, the, you, you will, the, the, the role that you take will have to be binding people from the different cross-functional teams uh, to achieve uh, a, a greater good. So I guess from my perspective with, uh, with regards to thought leadership, uh, to create that emotional hook, definitely number one is you must have the empathy. Between empathy and sincerity, you must be sincere about wanting to work with others and help with others. And then you must empathize. Behind every face, there is a story. Right? As we walk down the streets, we see thousands of faces. But behind every face, there is a story. There is a motivation. There is a worry. There is a concern. There is a dream. There is an inspiration. There is that that seed inside everybody. Everybody that you just need to uh, understand what they think and how do we then trigger that excitement, that energy, uh, that intention to then take on the next step. I give you an example. So in my in my previous roles, uh, and in fact, I've been blessed with all my roles were doing uh, change management process, right? whether it was improving the PNL of a company or it was setting up a new factory or it was improving a new product or it was uh, uh, driving the productivity improvement. If I was just a pure leader, there's two ways I can go about it. One way, command and control. You do this, make it happen. All right? And that was how uh, uh, you would find yourself evolving uh, as you enter the uh, the industry. When you're young, when you think that, oh, a leader is someone who drives that hard decision, and then you mimic that leadership style, you will find that it only gets you a certain way. So during my career, as I pride on myself at first, having that sharp and this is how we're going to do things, 
uh, uh, leadership style. I realized that that only gets me so far. And then when you start going down on the shop floor, you talk to the machinists, you talk to the uh, foreign workers who's doing the welding, you try to understand their concerns, you try to understand what their worries, what is their bottleneck, what's causing their delays. You listen to them, you empathize with their problem, and then you work together, empower them to come up with the solutions to help uh, us out of it. And that is a much more powerful tool than just a top-down approach. When everyone has an emotional hook, when everyone believes that this is the way forward, when everyone uh, is all aligned and our mindset is all uh, together, it moves the organization a lot better and a lot faster. So this is something that uh, they don't teach you in a textbook. And this is something that uh, I had to uh, learn and understand quickly in my, in my career. So, uh, so far as uh, uh, just doing that, from the top, this is how we're going to do it, we'll get you. Uh, but if you uh, are sincere and you really try to understand and empathize with the problems everyone is facing, and you get that emotional hook, and everyone is aligned to that strategic objective, it gets you even further. And most importantly, it's about bringing everyone on that journey. And you will enjoy that experience in the journey. So on the last note, right, I know it's like a very theoretical question. When you think about bringing everyone on this journey, right? How do you do that at scale in, let's say, like in your company, the current company that you're in? How do you do that at scale? So with the current company, there's about 1,500 people uh, in Saison. And in Rolls-Royce, there's even more, there's 50,000 people, right? So... There is this concept we call a shadow of a leader. Right? Uh, you only see your actions, but everyone sees your shadow. What is the shadow that you cast? Right? So in every, it is always a platform. Uh, you are always on this platform that everyone is looking at you. That's your shadow of a leader. People will always mimic what you do, or people will always look up to you. So whatever that you do, make sure you walk the talk. Right? Uh, in order to engage that wider audience. I don't think I have a silver bullet to it, but it's about the sincerity in every engagement. Every person that you talk to, every uh, post that you make, every email that you send out must all be uh, uh, aligned with your emotions and must be aligned with what you want everyone to, to achieve also. And I think importantly is in any change management, in any change that you're driving, the first step of change is always fear and worry. Once you manage to uh, uh, convince uh, and help others and do that quick win, to convince others that, hey, come on guys, we're in this together, I'm with you. The moment you get that, the moment people can see you uh, rolling up your sleeves and helping those uh, that is less fortunate on uh, helping those on the ground, they will follow. But it is not something that uh, you can drop off anytime. You need to continuously uh, communicate. There's no such thing as over-communicating in this perspective. Right? Just making sure that uh, the message is always the same. Uh, and it's uh, one tool that I realize uh, is very powerful. is for the message of hope. Yeah? So for guys on the shop floor, as you're driving that change management process, everyone is worried about change. But if you work together, you address the change, don't dismiss the concerns or the worries of others, address the change, and you paint the picture of hope. And you're going to uh, achieve the aspirations together. That's when you, you uh, are able to... to uh, uh, bring the masses, get the critical masses, and move together. Uh, and I can't, I can't stress it more. And I will just reiterate again: it's about enjoying that whole journey. In all the change management projects that I've done, I enjoy every single moment uh, because it's about bringing people together and driving that change. Okay, well, well, very, very, very nicely said. I've learned so much in terms of like 
more so being a leader in a sense. And I, I love your perspective on engineering, right? Moving on to the last section of the podcast, right? I just wanted to ask you, because I know uh, we, right now you are spending more time volunteering in a sense. And that's how, I mean, you, you are connected with Mr. Designer in the first place. Can you share with me your thoughts on how, how you're playing your part in terms of being in a community and what, what do you see in volunteering that appeals to you in a sense? So for me, uh, I've, I'm definitely excited to help in uh, Pasiris East and help uh, with Mr. Zaino. So this is not my first uh, experience in volunteering. Previously, I was uh, volunteering with, at Bukit Batok East also when I was back in Singapore from about 2008 to about 2012 before I left the UK. So it was uh, definitely, I was helping with Madam Halima at Bukit Batok East. So I really enjoyed that. Uh, and in fact, one of the reasons why I wanted to come back uh, from the UK was, and I jumped on the opportunity when they said there's this role in Singapore, I jumped on the opportunity is because uh, I truly wanted to uh, give back to society. Uh, so for myself, uh, I grew up in a, a, a lower middle class household. Uh, my dad uh, was retrenched in the 1990s. Uh, and he struggled to find a, a job. Uh, so he had to drive the taxi for about 20 years. My mom was an assistant nurse. So I was not born with a silver spoon, but I managed to get all this fantastic experience uh, through my parents' hard work. Uh, now that I've uh, been able to progress my career, uh, I am really excited to give back, to share all these experiences. I truly believe that there should be equal opportunity uh, for our use, uh, regardless of race, regardless of economic situation, regardless of uh, demographics that they're in. And that's why I, uh, when I came back, I immediately started sharing my experiences with uh, talks at ITE, polis, and universities. As long as it touches one, if even if it gives a minutiae of uh, uh, of uh, example to someone who can maybe progress his career forward, I'm, I'm happy with it. So I think that as a community, as a society, uh, we need to always uh, uh, plow back and help each other out. This COVID-19 experience is uh, definitely a very good example of it. If you look at how much the society has rallied and helped, has helped itself out, uh, you look at things like the SG Puka Puasa uh, initiative that was ground up. Uh, if you guys on the podcast are not aware, the SG Puka Puasa initiative is a, a ground up initiative where they prepare 20,000 meals a day for the needy. Imagine that 20,000 meals a day for the needy and they raised 3.5 million. Our Pasir Ris East guys, the volunteers came in every day, even though they are fasting, and it's uh, volunteers from across uh, uh, the demographics. We had uh, uh, not only the Malay Muslim community, but we had our uh, Chinese neighbors, our Indian neighbors, all coming together, volunteering to give out this food for the needy. And these are volunteers they're not paid for. Uh, they're, they're not paid. And all the other volunteer activities like uh, engineering good, uh, which uh, um, uh, receive 1,000 laptops that they refurbish, that they give to needy students. Right? Because in home-based learning, uh, uh, the students that uh, is most affected are the less fortunate students. So the, the, the one from the upper middle class, they have access to laptops, they have access to iPads, and they've got more devices in the home than the, uh, the kids, than the number of kids at home. Whereas on the other extreme end of the spectrum, it could be four kids sharing one laptop. And how do they take turns uh, doing this home-based learning? So Engineering Good, uh, that organization, they, they, they refurbish 1,000 laptops from the community to give out to all the needy, uh, needy children. So you see the, how society has rallied behind this, how they've given back uh, during this difficult period. It's definitely inspirational. If everyone can do it, what not me? I, and, and I feel that uh, having benefited from the experiences that I have, from the environment that I grew up in, from the uh, Singapore education system, 
it's time to give back. It's time to share these experiences and help others. Uh, and if it could just inspire anyone, I'm very happy with it. No, no, I just want to really take, take the time to really thank you for being on this podcast because I know that definitely from your experience, it's very useful. And I can really, because whenever I do a podcast session, right, I always think of, let's say, that engineer undergraduate who's out there and what what advice can he or she get that would be helpful in that sense. So I really appreciate you taking the time to be on this podcast. So ending of this podcast, right, can I just ask you some short fire questions, right? Who is your favorite engineer and why? <laughs> Is my favorite engineer. Uh, must be, is because, oh, sorry? It must be the Wright brothers. Oh, Wright brothers. Okay, why? Who were the first to flow, uh, fly the uh, aeroplane. Although it was a 17 seconds flight, uh, they started aerospace. The whole idea of aerospace and aircraft. So it is the Wright brother for me. Got it, got it. Because when I first got associated with this like engineering talk, right? I mean, um, how I got into this whole podcasting thing was all, all I look up to Elon Musk, right? As a, ah. I think, you know, to look up to him in a sense whereby, wow, he's really making that kind of impact on a world macro. So that's why I'm very fascinated to like talk to engineers in a sense of how, how they think, right? What is your favorite engineering company? It has to be Rolls Royce. <laughs> uh, definitely what's the best advice have you ever received and that's an interesting one the best advice I've ever received was short but it's powerful but it's something that I keep close to heart tomorrow must be a better day than today the whole idea of uh, continuous improvement uh, wherever you are at which stage in your life at whatever you do always strive to make things better take the next step take the next step keep on challenging yourself uh, and uh, keep on moving forward. Stay positive, keep on moving forward, and we'll get there. Got it. What is the worst advice have you ever received? The worst advice that I've ever received? <laughs> I, I don't think I've had any worst advice. Uh, I, I think the worst advice was uh, uh, just focus on your books, just focus on, uh, on your studies. So I think uh, it's life is more to just that so you guys who are still in school uh it's it's fine it's fine to fail it's fine to stumble uh along the way this is uh, just in part and parcel in life what is more important is how do you get back up and getting back up fast and then uh, uh starting to run back after you trip and fall well this is exactly the same as Mr. Zainal in a sense uh one year from now one year from now what tangible things would you like to happen that would make it the best year in your life? I think given the current, uh, the current time period, uh, even COVID-19, uh, we're just going through uh, the medical uh, elements of it. We're just going through the health bits of it, uh, making sure that we're free from infection and uh, uh, making sure that the situation in Singapore is stable. So that's the current phase that we have right now. But the next six months, the next 12 months is when the economic impact starts rolling in. And this is also going to start hitting us hard. So 12 months from now, I do hope that we together, as one Singapore, we get through this by helping one another, uh, making sure that uh, we work together and uh, uh, be better, be stronger for the future economy. No one gets left behind. Uh, jobs will be lost, but we will, and and things will be changed. There'll be a new norm, but together we need to get ourselves through this, and we need to help each other out during this time period. So that is my wishes for the next twelve months. God, I really, I really hope this COVID nineteen thing will be over very very soon. Okay, Mister Sh- Sharia, thanks so much for taking the time to join this podcast. Right, for any listeners out there, right, that might want to reach out to you, right, is there any possible ways that they can reach out to you? for any specific questions i know that um, i'll just link all the vid- uh, i'll leave some links in the video description i know that you and mr zaina are having like a like a like a webinar in a sense specifically targeted towards help i really hope that like all these kind of uh, uh conversations that you have with mr zaina and especially the youths right could be documented whether it's recording through zoom like, like this right but um yeah is there 
any way that uh, youths or undergraduates could reach out to you if they want to ask you specific questions? Definitely. Please, please feel free to contact me either via LinkedIn or my email address. I'll share with you my email address. Uh, I'm very happy to have that conversation. Uh, and when all this is over, we may be, we may have the opportunity to actually sit down over a cup of coffee and have that conversation. Or if you want me to have a conversation with a group of uh, people, I'm, I'm perfectly open to it. Uh, I am very excited to be talking to uh, youth, uh, especially those that uh, is trying to figure out what to do next or trying or need some help and guidance uh, on what they can do in their career. So feel free, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, you can Google me, you can get me on LinkedIn, you can uh, send me a mail uh, on my uh, Yahoo mail. Uh, I will be sharing it with you, JJ, if you don't mind uh, to put it on your, on your podcast also. So please feel free to con- contact with me uh, after this. Okay, Mr. Shari, thanks so much for taking the time to do this. And yeah, hope to see you on the next podcast very soon and hopefully in person. That, that being said, JJ, uh, thank you. Uh, I really uh, enjoyed this chat with you. Uh, and uh, stay safe and all the best, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you.